Uh, welcome everyone to today's session of Galactic Fidelity Seminar Series. Uh, before we begin our very interesting talk of today, uh, Shilpa has an announcement to make. Uh, over to you, Shilpa. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'd just like to remind you all to please fill in the form to update your um, Galford registration details. Um, even if you uh, registered with us recently, please fill in the form. And those who are in this talk because they were invited by someone else, please do fill in the form to, to register for the rest of the series. Um, I will put the link in the chat. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Shilpa. Um, I request everyone, uh, if they are not muted, please uh, mute themselves. The question and answer session will be after the talk. Uh, at which point uh, people can unmute themselves and ask the question directly or can post the questions in chat and I can read them out aloud. Uh, today, we, uh, we have as our speaker, uh, Ewan O'Sullivan, who is going to tell us about uh, Asian feedback in galaxy groups. Uh, Ewan works uh, at the Chandra X-ray Center of the Harvard uh, Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And he is very interested in the X-ray properties of galaxy groups, clusters, and individual ellipticals. Uh, over to you, Ian. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about AGM feedback in galaxy groups um, using uh, uh, observations at a variety of wavelengths. And uh, this is work that I've been doing with a, a large number of collaborators, some of whom are listed down here at the bottom. Particular thanks are owed to Konstantinos Kolokitas at Northwest University, who's done a lot of the radio analysis, which I will show during the talk. Also to Valeria Olivares at Kentucky, who's done some Muse uh, work, which I will discuss towards the end of the talk. And to Gerrit Schellenberger here at CFA, who's written some of the definitive papers on the kind of archetypal uh, cooling and feedback system for galaxy groups, NGC 5044. Um, so, um, if I can move forward. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, most of the galaxies in the universe are actually located in galaxy groups. They are the most common environment for galaxy groups. More than 50% of all galaxies live in a galaxy group and more than 50% of the mass in the universe is located in galaxy groups. And you can compare that to a few percent of galaxies which are uh, located in galaxy clusters. Groups are an interesting environment because they bring galaxies close together at uh, uh, low velocities, and that helps to promote interactions and mergers. And those drive galaxy evolution, the transformation of galaxies uh, from, from spirals to s and uh, ellipticals. Um, those tidal interactions between galaxies also drive gas stripping, and we do see evidence of shock heating in groups. So um, Stefan's Quintet here on the left is probably the most famous example. You can see a number of galaxies quite close together. And through the middle of there, there's a kind of blue ridge. That's actually shock heated gas. Um, a, a previous interaction between galaxies drew a hundred odd kiloparsec long H1 filament out of the disk of one of the spirals. It was then collided with at 900 kilometers a second by an infalling galaxy which shock heated all of that material up into the X-ray regime, heating up by about a million degrees. So we see some interesting events in these systems. Groups are also the mass scale on which we begin to form a hot intragroup medium, which becomes the hot intracluster medium. So we know that in individual galaxies, most of the baryons that we can see are in the form of stars or of cold gas. Whereas in galaxy clusters, the dominant baryonic component is a hot X-ray emitting medium, which fills the potential well and surrounds all of the galaxies. Groups are the mass scale on which we begin to build up that hot gas. But groups have shallower potential wells than galaxy clusters. And that means that uh, the impact of AGN and of mergers is greater in groups than it is in clusters. So, um, it's worth remembering that groups are quite a diverse class of systems. On um, the smallest uh, groups, the least massive systems would be things like our own local group, which might only contain one or two uh, medium to large spiral galaxies. 
as you go up in mass scales, you get to things like Higgs and 87 here on the left, where you can see that there's been a little bit of galaxy merging. There's at least one elliptical in there, but there's not very much in the way of hot gas. You go up the mass scale again, you get to medium sized systems like Stefan's Quintet, which have multiple galaxies, more evidence of interaction. You're beginning to build some hot gas there. And at the high mass end of groups, you get things like NGC 5044 on the right, which begin to look like kind of miniature galaxy clusters. There's a central dominant giant elliptical. There's a lot of hot gas in a big halo that extends around uh, the whole group and, and fills the potential well. And for feedback studies, um, which is what I'm talking about today, we're primarily interested in the X-ray bright systems. Um, so systems with masses of 10 to the 13 or 10 to the 14 solar masses, and those have X-ray temperatures in the range 0.5 to 2 kV. Now, if we're going to talk about feedback, we have to talk about the cooling flow problem. Um, this was an issue which was identified in galaxy clusters. Most of our, our knowledge of AGM feedback in these circumstances actually comes from studies of galaxy clusters. And basically what was found that was that clusters could be split into to two categories. Um, there were systems like the coma cluster shown on the right, which showed X-ray emission, had a clear X-ray halo, but were not particularly bright in the center and were disturbed systems. They were uh, typically systems which were still forming or had undergone mergers. And then you had um, more relaxed systems like Abel 478 on the left, um, which showed very strong peaks of X-ray emission in the center. And the reason for this is that the X-ray emission in galaxy clusters comes primarily from Brehm strahlung. That means that the rate of X-ray emission depends on the density of the gas squared. And so where the gas is able to relax, flow down into the center of the cluster and build up to high densities, you get very strong X-ray emission. And that means rapid cooling because the gas is able to radiate away its energy quite rapidly. Now one can estimate based on the X-ray emission, the cooling rates, and therefore the amount of material you would expect to cool out of the hot intracluster medium and to form cold gas or even to go further and form stars. And what was found was that the, those amounts of star formation, the amounts of cold gas that you saw were far lower than what you would expect based on the cooling rates measured in the X-ray. So there was this question of what suppressed cooling. And of course, the answer is AGM feedback. So once we got the Chandra and XMM observatories, we started to see images like this one of the Perseus cluster, the main image in the background here. That's a, a Chandra residual map, actually. They've subtracted off um, the, the kind of mean surface brightness uh, model of the cluster to show you the disturbed features in the middle of this system. And the most important features are the two dark patches in the center. Uh, hopefully you can see my arrow, these guys here and here. And then there are some others further out, this one up here, for example, this one over here. And these are what's referred to as cavities. Um, these are places in the intracluster medium where the hot gas has been pushed aside by something else. And so the X-ray emission along that line of sight is lower than we would expect. The question was what has pushed it aside? And the answer of course is, is the lobes of the AGN of the central dominant galaxy. So the image on the right shows you uh, an optical X-ray radio combination image. You can see some of the galaxies around the, uh, the core of the system. The central dominant galaxy is in the center. You have the same X-ray image in blue. And uh, in this case, the cavities are filled in by that, that red um, region, which is the, the radio lobes of the central dominant galaxy, NGC 1275. So what we have here is a situation where the hot intracluster medium cools, uh, begins to form some cooler gas, which flows into the central galaxy, fuels the AGM, which launches jets. Those jets inflate lobes. The lobes do work on the surrounding gas as they expand out into it and they heat it up and reduce or stop the cooling. So we have a feedback loop where the cooling uh, causes its own reheating. Now, we see these kinds of things in many clusters, groups, individuals, ellipticals now. And what we also see in many cases are these kind of filamentary structures, which you can see in the image on the right. These turn out to be visible at a variety of wavelengths, and these are uh, where the cooling is occurring. So we see them in the X-ray, but we also see them in wave bands like H alpha, which traces gas at uh, tens of thousands of Kelvin. Uh, we see them in molecular hydrogen, which traces much cooler material. And we even see them down in CO emission, which traces the densest, coolest molecular clouds. So what this is telling us is that the material in these filaments is very multi-phase. 
Um, it's able to cool right the way down from the X-ray to, to the molecular gas phase. And if we look at the velocity uh, maps of, of this gas, what we find is that it does not move with the stars of the galaxy. In fact, it doesn't have particularly strong velocity gradients in it at all. It appears to be pinned to the surrounding hot intracluster medium. So this is clearly material which has formed from that medium. It's not material that's formed from the stars in the central galaxy. It does show a little bit of star formation. There are some clusters which have significant star formation rates in their central dominant galaxy, but it's not anything like the rate of star formation one would have expected based on the uh, cooling rates from the X-ray. So one can ask the question of whether we see the same kind of things in groups. And of course we do. Um, there are now a number of examples, but I'm going to talk briefly about this system, NGC 6338, which we did some work on uh, a year or so ago now, maybe two years. Um, this is a high mass system for a galaxy group. It's actually two galaxy groups which are merging. Perhaps you can see in the image on the right that there are two cores uh, with a slightly fainter region between them. We actually decided to observe this system because we were interested in the, the merger, which is very high velocity and is causing a lot of uh, shock heating in the system. But it turns out that both cores show evidence of cooling and feedback. And so it's also interesting in that regard. Um, if we look at the south core first, so that's the, the larger, more massive core that's actually centered on NGC 6338 itself. Perhaps you can even see in the main image, there's a kind of inverted Y shape in the center there. And the image up on the top left shows you a Chandra X-ray image in the background with H alpha contours overlaid. You can see that extending out from the core, there are three filaments which show up in the X-ray, but also show up in the H alpha. If we measure the temperature of the X-ray emitting gas, uh, that produces the temperature map shown at the bottom. You can see that the coolest material in blue is along the line of those filaments. So the cooling is in filaments as it would be in a cluster and we see the H alpha emission that's, that's material cooling out of the X-ray phase. So that shows us pretty much what we expect on the cooling side. When we worked on this system originally, there were no known radio jets or lobes uh, in the center of this core. What we did instead to look for heating was to go and look for cavities. So the image on the top right shows you a residual map. Um, again, I've, I've modeled the overall surface brightness of the group and subtracted it off the X-ray image to, to look for residual features. So there are two dark patches in the center. Those were potential cavities which were known before we started working on this system. We also found a third one, which is marked by that dashed ellipse. Perhaps you can see that that's a slightly darker region with a rim of somewhat brighter material around it. That we thought was a, another potential cavity. And because it's on the end of those two filaments, it might be involved in drawing those filaments out from the core. Um, after we published this, there was some work from LOFAR, which confirmed that there were actually radio lobes in this system. And we then followed those up with the GMRT. And you can see a, a, a band four uh, set of GMRT contours marked on the lower image which fill in that cavity and also uh, trace a radio lobe on the other side of the core, which matches up with some other regions of, of somewhat negative residuals. So we have both cooling and heating in the south core. In the north core, things are a little bit uh, more difficult because it's, it's a bit smaller and it's a bit more disturbed by the, um, uh, the forces associated with the merger. But we see similar things. We see a bar of emission extending across the core in the X-ray with blobs of bright X-ray emission along it. Uh, we see that that's the coolest material, uh, temperature map there on the bottom left. And in the coolest, brightest part of that bar, we see H alpha emission as traced by the contours. My colleague uh, Xian Pan had already observed this using the SDSS Manga IFU and had traced that H alpha emission and she then followed that up with observations with NOEMA to trace molecular gas and was able to show that the H alpha and the molecular gas uh, occupy the same location. They are a blob centered in the coolest part of that bar of X-ray emission with some filaments of this cool gas extending down to the core of the central galaxy. There are actually cavities in the center of here as well, although they're a little difficult to, to see. Um, they're essentially on either side of the bar. So we have evidence of heating and cooling in the north core as well. 
one of the things one can do once one has detected cavities in these systems is one can get a good estimate of the energy that's being put into the system by the AGM jets in terms of what we call the cavity enthalpy. So we know that the uh, energy required to inflate the radio lobe is basically the pressure of the surrounding medium times the vol volume of the lobe, so P times V. We also know that there's another 3PV of energy which is stored inside the lobe in terms of its relativistic particles and magnetic field. So the total energy or total enthalpy involved in producing a radio lobe is 4PV. And if we want that as a power, so the power that the jet puts out, we can divide it by the time scale over which the lobe is inflated. People generally use either a buoyancy time scale or a sonic time scale. So that's the energy that's being put into the system by the AGM. The energy that's being lost to the system is the X-ray luminosity of the cooling region of the group. And that can be defined in various ways, but for our purposes, I'm gonna define it as being the X-ray luminosity within the region defined as having a cooling time less than three giga years. So this plot on the right basically shows you power being put in on the y-axis versus power being taken out on the x-axis. And the gray points are from a large sample of uh, groups, clusters, and ellipticals by Panagulia and collaborators. And you can see that they mostly fall around the solid line, which is marked 4PV. That line is basically saying, if we were able to get all of the energy out of the radio lobes and put it into the hot intergroup medium, that would be enough to balance the, the losses from, from radiation. So you can see that with a degree of scatter, most of these systems are in thermal balance. And where I've marked the blue points, those represent the cavities in the NGC 6338 group. And again, they fall close to thermal balance. However, there are some important differences between groups and clusters, which I'm gonna uh, talk about a little bit now. Um, one difference is to do with cooling. The plot on the right shows you profiles of cooling time in the hot intracluster medium for a large sample of galaxy clusters, the accept sample. And if you look at large radii, you can see that most of those profiles fall roughly on top of one another. And then what that's telling you is that in the outskirts of clusters, the cooling behavior is much the same regardless of what kind of cluster you're looking at. If you look in the center though, there's a huge variation in the central cooling time of these systems from cooling times down around a few hundred million years to cooling times which are longer than the age of the universe. And um, people generally divide clusters up by this central cooling time. Uh, this scheme that I'm showing here divides them into non-cool core, weak cool core and strong cool core systems. Strong cool cores have cooling times less than a gig year. In other words, they're cooling very rapidly. Non-cool cores have cooling times longer than 7.7 .7 giga years. Now that time scale is chosen because it's the look back time to redshift of one, which is roughly when most clusters achieve their current mass. Systems that have cooling times longer than that, uh, what you're essentially saying is that since the cluster formed, it's not yet had time to cool down very much. And then we have weak cool core systems, which are between those two boundaries. The reason this is important is because it turns out that um, evidence of cooling in the form of H alpha emission, CO emission or star formation, and evidence of feedback in the form of AGM jets are very strongly correlated with this. So essentially all the feedback, all of the cooling is found in uh, primarily in strong cool core systems and to a lesser extent in weak cool cores. Non cool cores do not show this kind of, uh, these kinds of features. And that's important because it tells you that the AGM and this, this cool gas is all material that's been um, coming out of the intercluster medium. Uh, we're not seeing AGM jets which are launched, fueled by material that was, for example, found within the central galaxy without uh, cooling having taken place. So that's clusters. We can split them up into these three categories. How about groups? The groups, it turns out, are a bit different. Um, essentially, all of the groups that we can observe are cool cores. There are a few weak cool cores, not very many. Almost all of the groups that we know about are strong cool cores. You can see that their cooling times are very short um, compared to the clusters. And this turns out to be because of differences in the way the X-ray emission works at these different temperatures. Uh, on the left, I've got some example kind of model spectra, uh, uh, X-ray spectra for, for a 6 kV cluster and a 1 kV galaxy group. 
the cluster you can see is primarily a continuum emission spectrum. That's the Bremstrahlen continuum. And then you have a few emission lines sticking up above that. The only really strong emission lines are around uh, six or seven keV. Most of the emission that's coming out of the clusters is coming out through Bremstrahlen emission. It's Bremstrahlen that determines the cooling time. In the group spectrum, the one keV spectrum, you can see that there are uh, a lot more emission lines. And once you get down to around 1 kV, there's this huge bump in the spectrum, which is the iron L complex, um, emission lines associated with iron and with some other materials like nickel. That turns out to have a very strong impact on, on how much energy the, the gas can radiate away in groups compared to in clusters. Groups are much more efficient at radiating away their energy and therefore they cool faster. And that's probably the explanation for why we don't see any non-cool core groups. So given that we expect uh, cooling and feedback to be associated strongly with strong cool cores, we should expect to see a lot more feedback in groups than clusters perhaps. Now, there are some other important differences, one of which is to do with the efficiency of heating. Um, there was a very important study by Phil Best and collaborators, which looked at a large sample of radio galaxies in a variety of environments and tried to estimate what the efficiency of heating was in those systems. Uh, essentially what efficiency would be needed to balance cooling in the surrounding environment. What they found was that efficiency has to drop. Uh, in clusters, it has to be higher and in groups, it has to be lower. And in fact, some follow-up work by Jardini et al showed that if it's not lower efficiency in groups, you will actually uh, not just overheat the groups, you will unbind their gas and blow it out of the system. Now we see some evidence that gas has been moved around in groups. The plot here on the right shows you the gas fraction against mass within the radius R500. And you can see the blue points on the right for galaxy clusters, they fall up near the horizontal gray bar, which is the universal baryon fraction, indicating that the clusters are able to hang on to their gas uh, and keep it within R500. The group and poor cluster systems are the kind of multicolored points over on the left hand side. And you can see that they have gas fractions which are well below the universal baryon fraction. In fact, if you add the stars in, it doesn't uh, bring them up that much higher. So that is an indicator that gas has been pushed out of the cores of these groups. We think it's been pushed out to large radii rather than being blown right out of the system. But obviously there's uh, the strongest contender for what's caused that is AGM feedback from the, the dominant AGM. So there's a question about why that efficiency change might happen. Why might you have lower efficiency heating in the sensitive groups than in clusters? And one uh, solution which has a lot going for it is a model that's sometimes referred to as bubbling feedback. This essentially says that in the time in which uh, in a cluster you would have one large powerful feedback episode in a group, you will have several smaller ones. Essentially, the cooling time in the group is shorter, so you're able to produce some cold gas relatively quickly, but you don't produce that much because the group is, is that much smaller than the cluster. So you fuel a short outburst, which heats the surrounding material for a little while, but then cooling starts again and you fuel another outburst and another and another. And we actually do see many groups where we see evidence of multiple outbursts over periods of, say, a few hundred million years which would fit into this model very well. But we also see some systems where that doesn't seem to work. We see uh, groups which host large, powerful central radio galaxies. Uh, there was some work recently by Thomas Pacini and collaborators, which is shown in this plot on the right. So on the y-axis, we have the X-ray luminosity, which is essentially a proxy for mass here. And on the X-axis, we have the radio power of the central uh, AGN, and you can see that the diamond points at the top, which are the galaxy clusters, follow a fairly straightforward linear relationship, uh, which makes sense as the cluster mass goes up, you need a more powerful radio galaxy to balance cooling. But the groups don't seem to fit into that particularly well. And uh, in fact, you can see that there are some really powerful radio galaxies in the groups. And they're also large, uh, it turns out. They're actually larger than, than many of the radio galaxies in the clusters. So this leaves us with a bit of a, a conundrum as to, to what's going on in these systems. Now to resolve that, what we would like to do is to get a good representative unbiased sample of groups to work with. And that turns out to be a bit tricky. The reason being that we have the option of doing either X-ray selection or optical selection, and both of them have important biases. X-ray selection is great because 
what you're essentially doing is going and looking for the hot gas that's trapped in the potential well of the group. If you can see that hot gas, you know that there is a dark matter potential there. You know you're looking at a, a fully collapsed, virialized galaxy group. But the problem is, if you're interested in looking at these systems in the nearby universe, which we are, your only all sky survey right now to, to base your search on is the ROSAT all sky survey which is um, unfortunately a little bit shallow for our purposes. There was some excellent work looking at galaxy clusters, which showed that as you went down the cluster mass scale, you began to see more and more bright centrally concentrated clusters at low masses. And that was not an indication of a change in cluster properties. It was an indication that the survey was not deep enough to detect the fainter, less concentrated systems. And that applies to the galaxy groups as well. You could of course use deeper surveys um, done on more limited fields. But there you tend to detect groups at moderate redshift, redshifts of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And at those distances, it becomes difficult to um, look at the morphology in detail, to look at the interaction between the AGN and the, the surrounding gas, which of course is what we're interested in. Uh, given a few years, the new uh, surveys from Irizita will probably resolve this problem. It, it looks like Eurosita will essentially detect every X-ray bright group in the local universe. Um, so we will be able to do better, but right now those surveys are not available. The alternative is to do optical selection. So to just look at large um, galaxy surveys and trying to find groups in them. And of course, many people have done that. There are, are many large group surveys done with, uh, based on optical catalogs. The problem is that as you go down the mass range, uh, you start to find more and more false groups included. So um, systems which are just chance associations of galaxies along the line of sight, uh, systems which are probably um, galaxies which are close together, but which are not yet fully collapsed and realized. And there was some work looking at trying to get good optical mass estimates for groups and clusters, which showed that below about 30 members, or in some cases below 50 members, none of the optical mass estimators really work. That's an indication that the groups at that point are, are perhaps include a significant number of unbound systems. So what we decided to do was to combine these two methods. We would do an optical selection of groups and then we would follow it up in the X-ray and indeed other wave bands. And we called this project the Complete Local Volume Group Sample or CLOGS. We started out with an old optical group sample, the Leon Galaxy group sample, which is all sky, optically selected, covers systems within about 80 megaparsecs, has about 500 groups in it. We selected within that to take systems which have at least four members, at least one large early type member, because we know that the presence of hot gas is strongly correlated with the, the presence of an early type member. And we asked for systems which had declinations above minus 30 degrees so that they would be visible for VLA and GMRT. The reason being, of course, that we are interested in looking at the radio galaxies. So that gets us to about 67 groups. We do some work to expand and refine the galaxy membership of those systems because newer galaxy catalogues have become available since the Lyon catalog was put together. We also do some work to throw out problematic cases that have slipped through. So we look at things like isodensity maps, such as the one up here on the right, that just shows you all of the galaxies in one group and contours of their projected density. You can see that in that case, there's a nice clear core. And in fact, the dominant elliptical falls right in the middle of that core. But we found one or two cases where we, what we thought was the dominant galaxy would not fall in the center. It would fall perhaps off in that little clump of galaxies up in the top left. And there we would say, well, clearly this is probably two groups. We should separate the two of them, throw them back into the pot and see if they still make it through the selection criteria. We also filter on richness. So basically just on the number of bright galaxies in the group, um, systems that have richnesses greater than or equal to 10 turn out to be nearby galaxy clusters or parts of galaxy clusters. Groups which have richness of one are probably a bit too small for us to characterize properly. And so we throw those out as well. And we end up with 53 groups, which we can divide into a high and low richness subsample of roughly equal size. So we then follow up that optically selected sample, uh, primarily in the X-ray. So we've observed all of our groups with either Chandra or XMM, and we've observed 25 of them with both satellites. And I should say that these two satellites have complementary capabilities. So XMM has the larger collecting area, and for the kind of work we want to do, it also has the, the larger field of view.
that makes it good for detecting faint systems and for tracing their properties out to large radius. Chandra on the other hand has half arc second spatial resolution, which is um, unmatched by any other X-ray instrument. That makes it great for searching for the kind of disturbed structures that I showed you in the Perseus cluster. It's, it's fantastic for detecting cavities. So we have complete X-ray coverage. We also have complete radio coverage. Uh, we observed all of our systems with GMRT at 610 and 235 megahertz. Uh, and of course, they are uh, chosen to fall in the VLA surveys. We're also still collecting radio data for these systems. We have a few targets which have been observed by Meerkat already. Um, we surveyed all of the dominant galaxies with the IRAM 30 meter or APEX telescopes to search for CO emission from molecular gas to track the cooling side of things. We also got MU's IFU data for 18 dominant galaxies in high richness groups. And then we have a variety of supporting data long slit spectra, wide field optical imaging, various other things, some of which has been uh, analyzed and published, some of which is, is still waiting to be looked at. So what do we find when we put these things together? Well, uh, 26 of our 53 groups, so about 50% of them, turn out to have full scale group size X-ray halos, uh, hot gas that extends at least 65 kiloparsecs from the dominant galaxy and has luminosities greater than 10 to the 41 Earths per second. Another 30% have smaller galaxy scale X-ray halos just associated with the dominant galaxy. And then 20% of our groups don't have any diffuse X-ray emission. So we might detect the individual galaxies or their AGN in the X-ray, but we don't see hot gas. Where we are detecting hot gas, the temperatures are in the range of about 0.5 to 1.5 kV, which gives us a mass range of 0.5 to 5, 10 to the 13 for I think those are values of M500 for those of you who, who worry about those kinds of things. For the group scale halos, about a third of them are dynamically active. Uh, so we see evidence that they are undergoing or have recently undergone major or minor mergers. 11 of the 26 host central radio jet sources and 12 of the 26 were not previously identified as extra bright groups, and eight of them were not detected by the Rosa Holsky survey at all. That's kind of interesting because it means that probably 40% or maybe a little more of nearby groups in the local universe have not been detected in the X-ray before. They're still out there waiting for us to go and find them. The reason that they were not detected is pretty much what you would expect. They are systems like the two shown here on the right. Uh, the upper uh, system, NGC 5982, is a nice relaxed looking group that has extended X-ray emission, but it's a bit faint to be picked up by the Rosa Holsky survey. The lower system, NGC 1060, is certainly bright enough to be detected if it was relaxed, but as you can see, it's a kind of a train wreck merger, basically two groups have plowed right into each other. And you're left with um, this big arc of emission where gas has been drawn out between the two cores as they've passed by. Now we can do the same kind of thing that I showed you earlier with the kind of thermal balance plot, um, power in from the AGM versus power out from the uh, radiative luminosity. Uh, Konstantinos Kolokaitas did this in 2018 for the high richness half of our sample. So again, we have the, the thermal balance line running up through the center. We have the gray points from the Panagulia sample. And you can see that for many of the groups in the high richness half, uh, which show jets or cavities, they fall on the line. And so they are in thermal balance. But there are two systems which fall well above it. In fact, they fall a couple of orders of magnitude above it. Those are the two uh, uh, systems shown on the left, NGC 4261 and NGC 193. 4261 is interesting in that it's, it's a very well-known, powerful FR1 radio galaxy. And some detailed X-ray imaging of the core of that system shows that the jets seem to have cut channels through the cooling core of the system and only begun to expand lobes once they were outside it. That's interesting because it means that the heating is probably being done outside of the region where it's most needed. On the other hand, NGC 193 shown below, that's an X-ray image, heavily smooth with radio contours overlaid. And you can see the X-ray image shows this kind of ring structure. That probably indicates that as the, uh, radio sources expanded, it's basically blown all of the gas out of the center of that system and, and pretty much completely destroyed the cool core. So we're seeing quite different um, behavior in these two systems, but neither of them really fits into this bubbling model. 
And in fact, when we move on to look at the low richness half of the sample, we see other problematic systems. So on the left, we have NGC 5903. That shows uh, in the X-ray emission that's shown in blue, perhaps you can see there's a big cavity on one side of that system. That cavity turns out to be very large. It is filled by radio emission, but the, the cavity power is about 100 times the cooling luminosity. And this is one of the rare groups where the central cooling time is actually pretty long. This is a weak cool core rather than a strong cool core system, probably because that AGN outburst has been powerful enough to really disrupt the cool core and, and, and move things around quite a lot. In the center, we have the famous giant plumed FR1 galaxy NGC 315. That's in the center of one of our groups. It has radio plumes, which extend out at least 100 kiloparsecs, and it has no clearly detected cavities. That suggests that it may well be that those jets are, are dumping their energy far, far outside the, the central cooling region. Um, and then we have NGC 1407 on the bottom right. That's a merging group in which one of the cores hosts this big blob of diffuse radio emission, which we think is a pair of old radio lobes that have kind of lost definition and, and partially merged together. There are no clear cavities in there. And so it's a bit difficult to tell how much heating has actually gone on. There is actually a young radio source in the center of that system. It looks like the AGM has switched on again relatively recently. So we have a number of problematic cases that don't really fit into the kind of bubbling feedback model that's been suggested. So that's the heating side of things. How about the cooling side? Well, as I said, we've surveyed all of our dominant galaxies with the RM30 meter or apex telescopes to search for CO emission from molecular gas. There are some example spectra from the two different uh, observatories down at the bottom. Our CO detection fraction is about 50%. And our H1 detection fraction, just from literature measurements, is more than 50% for these systems, which is perhaps a bit surprising for giant ellipticals in the middle of groups. The molecular gas masses are of the order of 10 to the 8 solar masses. Star formation rates are 0.01 to 1 solar masses per year. That means the depletion times for that molecular gas are fairly short, less than a gig a year. So these are not reservoirs of material that sits around for a long time. It has to be replenished on a regular basis. We can compare our group dominant galaxies to normal ellipticals because our survey has a similar depth to that of the Atlas 3D survey of, of elliptical galaxies. So as I said, our detection rate is about 50%. Detection rate for normal ellipticals is only about 20%. So clearly it's, uh, uh, you're more likely to have molecular gas in your elliptical galaxy if it's in the center of a group. We can look at these two plots, which show the two different samples uh, with radio luminosity on the y-axis and molecular gas mass on the x-axis. And the diagonal lines extending across here are showing you the relationship one would expect if the radio emission comes from star formation fueled by the molecular gas at the kind of rates that we see in uh, star forming galaxies. So in other words, what radio emission one would one expect if that molecular gas is forming stars rather than fueling an AGN. Now for the plot on the bottom left, which is the Atlas 3D ellipticals, you can see that most of the points fall along those lines. In other words, where they're detected in the radio, that radio is at least consistent with coming from star formation. There are a few points which fall above the line. Those are the, the strong AGN. If you look at the clogs group dominant galaxies on the right, you can see that far more of those fall above the relationship many more of them are AGN, as you would expect in the centers of galaxy groups. But it's not the case that the mass of molecular gas is what drives the AGN activity. You can see that we have AGN outbursts fueled by systems which have quite low molecular gas masses, and that actually our most molecular gas rich systems are consistent with being star forming. I've also marked in blue all of the systems which uh, are found in the sense of X-ray bright groups with lots of hot gas. And you can see there's not a strong correlation there either. That's telling us that in some of these systems, it's probably not cooling, which is producing the molecular gas. It's probably merges with gas rich galaxies. And of course in groups, that's actually quite feasible. Whereas in clusters, it's very difficult to get a gas rich galaxy, cold gas rich galaxy from the outskirts of the cluster down to the center and slow it down enough to merge with the dominant galaxy without it being heavily stripped on the way in. Now, if we want to know what's going on with that gas, these kind of single dish measurements uh, are not um, 
uh, not quite as, as diagnostic as we would like, there what we do is move on to these H-alpha IFU uh, data that we have from Muse. So this is Valeria Olivares' work, which will hopefully be published within the next few months. And in each of these images, we have a, a continuum image showing you basically the stellar population on the left, and then an H-alpha image on the right. Orange contours show you the H-alpha emission overlaid on the, the continuum, and then there are some radio contours overlaid on some of these guys as well. So we see a variety of morphologies. Um, NGC 5846 on the top left looks very much like the kind of filamentary system that we saw in the Perseus cluster. But then we also see systems that look like uh, H-alpha rings, kind of spiral structures that might be disks. And we see some systems that have a little bit of H-alpha in the center, but not very much. Interestingly, the two at the bottom are NGC 4261 and NGC 193, which I said earlier were two of the most powerful radio galaxies in our sample. You can look at the velocity measurements, of course, because this is IFU data. So the third plot in each of these rows is, is velocity and the fourth plot is velocity dispersion. For the filamentary systems, we don't see a lot in the velocity maps. As with the clusters, it appears that those filaments are kind of pinned to the surrounding hot gas. But when we go and look at some of the other systems, we do see strong rotation signatures. So for ESO 507 minus 25, rotation is very clear in that that uh, disc or ring, that may be a system which has gained its gas through a merger. That would explain why there's rotation there. But even for some of the small systems, we do see rotation signatures as in the case of NGC 978 at the bottom there. Now, um, that's the ionized gas. It would be nice to be able to do similar things with the molecular gas. Unfortunately, there are not many of these systems which have been observed yet with ALMA, which is the instrument that's capable of doing that kind of work. And we also have the issue that our systems are quite close by. And this means that ALMA, being an interferometer, is able to resolve um, small spatial features very nicely. It can trace it right the way down to kind of um, individual molecular cloud complexes in these galaxies. Unfortunately, it resolves out the more diffuse emission um, and so some of the work that was done traced a bunch of small clouds, but was not able to recover all of the CO emission that had been detected with single dishes. So an example is shown in the two plots on the bottom left. Those are uh, an H alpha map and a, a dust map of NGC 5846. Um, this is work by Pasquale Temi and his collaborators. And you can see that there are some contours overlaid on there. Those are uh, ALMA CO emission contours, and you can see that they are picking up dense molecular clouds which lie on top of dusty H-alpha rich filaments, but they're not picking up that many of them. If you want to capture all of the CO emission, capture all of the molecular gas, you need to use the Atacama compact array, um, which is able to, to resolve these um, larger scale features. That was demonstrated by some work by Gerrit Schellenberger, which is kind of shown here on the right. That's an X-ray image of the center of NGC 5044. You can see a couple of cavities marked by those big dashed ellipses. The background image is, is a Chandra X-ray image, which has been somewhat smoothed. And you can see on top of that, there are some pale blue cyan contours, which trace the filamentary H-alpha emission, which kind of wraps around those cavities. Now it was known from previous work by Larry David that there were a bunch of small uh, molecular gas clouds in the center of this, but Garrett then worked with the ACA data and produced those blue contours, which trace the more diffuse uh, CO component and retrieve most of the molecular gas mass. And of course that's located exactly where you would expect it to be. It's in the center of a bunch of X-ray filaments, which are correlated with H-alpha filaments. It's in the densest, coolest region where you expect uh, cooling to have pushed gas all the way down to the molecular regime and it's centered around the AGM which is where you need it to fuel uh, feedback. However while we were working on this stuff other people were looking at some of our other systems for other reasons. So this is some work by Boisel and collaborators who looked at some systems which happened to be in our sample with the goal of measuring their black hole masses. So they did ALMA observations at very high resolution um, for NGC 315 and NGC 4261 because they were very powerful FR1 radio galaxies. And instead of finding filamentary nebulae, 
what they found were little rotating discs, a few hundred uh, parsecs across. So you can see on the centre column, very clear rotation signatures uh, in those molecular gas discs. One might wonder whether this is um, telling you about the resolution problem with, with ELMA and that perhaps there's more extended CO emissions surrounding this. Perhaps there are filaments further out. But it's worth bearing in mind that when we looked at the MUSE data for NGC 4261, the H alpha was very compact and did not show filaments. So we have a bit of a mystery here. This does not look like what we see in galaxy clusters. And it's probably important if this is fueling these giant F01 galaxies, uh, which may not fit into the bubbling feedback model. Perhaps we're looking at um, a different mode of feedback or a different fueling method of feedback that alters how things work in groups as compared to clusters. So we have a bit of a mystery. And uh, clearly there is work still to be done. Um, so let me summarize what I've told you. Uh, I've described our, our complete local volume group sample, which is an optically selected statistically complete sample of groups, which have then been followed up in the X-ray and the radio and at other wavelengths. Uh, from that sample, we can tell that a significant fraction of X-ray bright groups in the local universe have not been identified in previous surveys. They are still waiting to be discovered. Uh, they are typically either disturbed or low luminosity systems. That's why they were missed by the Rosa-Holmskai survey. A subset of group central AGN appear to be overpowered with cavity powers 100 times the cooling luminosity. And in some cases, they have jets which extend well beyond the cooling region. That may explain the efficiency changes that we see between groups and clusters in terms of jet heating. Um, possibly if your jets are dumping most of their energy at large radius, they don't, they're less efficient at heating the cooling region. When we look at cool gas, we see lots of evidence of H alpha, uh, H1, CO in more than 50% of group central galaxies. And in some of them, we see the same kinds of filamentary nebulae that we see in clusters but some powerful radio galaxies seem to be fueled by small rotating disks rather than by these filamentary systems. And so, uh, as is always the case with observational talks, we need more data. Um, as I said, we have some meerkat observations coming in of some of these systems, which should be great for the H1, which is probably the least explored part of the, the cool gas component of these systems, and also good for looking at, at faint um, continuum emission associated with the radio sources. We are proposing for more ALMA and ACA observations to look at the molecular gas. We're certainly planning to propose more MUSE observations to get uh, more data on the H alpha. And I think there's still work to be done in the, the X-ray as well. Hopefully in the next few years, e Rosita surveys will become public and we'll start to trace some of the population of groups which have not been known uh, from the previous surveys. They will certainly tell us uh, much more clearly about the population statistics of groups in the local universe. But of course, it's a survey instrument. And so we will still need to do these kind of in-depth studies to understand what's going on with cooling and feedback in galaxy groups. And with that, I will finish. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that lovely talk. Uh, if uh, there are any questions, uh, no doubt there are actually, uh, please either put them in the chat and I can uh, um, read them out al al aloud, or please unmute yourself and ask questions directly. While we wait for the audience to ask questions, uh, I had a question, uh, maybe I missed the part, but uh, you mentioned that some of the groups in clocks don't show any X-ray emission. And there is another group which has uh, jetted radio agents. What's the overlap between the two? That's, that's a, an excellent question. Um, we do have uh, a number of systems which don't show X-ray emission and um, it's, or at least X-ray emission from diffuse gas. And so in those systems, it's worth remembering that we can't actually be sure that those systems are gravitationally bound. Only the presence of, of X-ray emitting gas would really confirm that. But as you say, um, there is some overlap between those systems and systems which have uh, jetted uh, emission from the central AGN. There's one system in particular, um, which is very X-ray faint, 
but which has uh, a huge old pair of radio lobes in the center. And it happens to have a large H1 disc and a bunch of molecular gas. Uh, and it's probably the case that the AGM was fueled by material that was brought in by a gas rich merger. Um, it's actually kicking off another episode of jet activity right now, uh, which people are looking at for other reasons, but, but that's very interesting. That's a rare case though. In the majority of our systems, the, the jets do seem to be fueled by material from, uh, uh, or at least the jets located in systems which are X-ray bright. Thank you so much. So we have a question in the chat from Sarah. Uh, I, I, Sarah is asking, uh, Ian, uh, please could you comment on using a blind H1 survey to identify group? Or so, bl using blind um, H1 survey? Sure. Um, there's a lot of very interesting work that's been done using H1 to look at groups. Um, and in fact, if you're interested in group evolution, which I am, um, H1 surveys have, have told us a lot about group evolution um, because when you get systems a bit like Stefan's Quintet, as I talked about right at the start of the talk, and you start to have a lot of uh, mergers and interactions between the galaxies, you go through a phase where material is often stripped out of the, the disks of the galaxies and it can actually form um, things that look like a cold intragroup medium you can actually find systems which have a lot of diffuse H1 surrounding the galaxies, or in some cases, more kind of filamentary structures or clouds that are between the galaxies. So one can do blind H1 surveys and go looking for those kinds of structures. Um, and they will tell you that at least these galaxies are close enough together to undergo significant numbers of interactions and therefore are probably gravitationally bound and are in the process of, of um, undergoing evolution and becoming uh, more developed systems. Um, but that tends to trace systems which are a lower mass scale than the ones that I'm talking about. And because uh, you have to go down to quite um, low column densities to find that kind of stuff, it's, uh, it has in the past been relatively difficult to, to find systems that look like that. There are a number of, of very good examples, but it's perhaps not in the most efficient way of, of identifying gravitationally bound systems. I think in future, when we can go to um, uh, lower column densities, that may actually be a very interesting way of finding lower mass groups that have not yet built up their hot X-ray halo. Uh, and uh, I wonder whether that's something that Meerkat and, and uh, perhaps some of the Australian telescopes will end up doing. I mean, we are now seeing papers every couple of weeks telling us about fantastic H1 structures found in galaxy groups uh, by these new instruments. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? If, if there aren't, please join me in a round of applause for our speaker.